Shalom Aleichem, welcome. I'm Lisa Newman, the Yiddish Book Center's Director of Publishing and Public Programs. And as always, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Yiddish Book Center's virtual theater for this evening's program, Wandering Through the Land of the Postscript, a discussion of Hava Rosenfarb's short stories with Goldie Morgenthaler. Before we get started, a few notes for you. Your audio and your video will be off throughout the program. You may send us your questions via the question panel. We ask that you keep questions short so we can get to all of them. And if you could please refrain from sending comments so we can address the questions in the immediate. Thanks. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's presenter, Goldie Morgenthaler. Goldie is Professor Emeritus Emirata at the University of Lethbridge, where she taught 19th century British and American literature and modern Jewish literature. She is the translator from Yiddish to English of much of Hava Rosenfarb's work, including uh, Rosenfarb's seminal Holocaust novel, The Tree of Life, a trilogy of life in the Lodge Ghetto. Her translations of Hava Rosenfarb's fiction have won a Canadian Jewish Book Award, as well as the Modern Language Association's Memorial Prize in Yiddish Studies. She is the editor and one of the translators of a collection of Hava Rosenfarb's essays called Confessions of a Yiddish Writer and Other Essays. This collection won a 2019 Canadian Jewish Literary Award and a 2020 Siegel Award. She has also translated into English several short stories by the Yiddish classical writer I.L. Parrots. She is a former language columnist for the Montreal Gazette, as well as the author of a book on Dickens and of numerous articles on Victorian literature, including one on the translations of Dickens into Yiddish. Her translation of Hava Rosenfarb's play, The Bird of the Ghetto, provided the English subtitles for the Yiddish language 2021 Zoom production of the play by Folksbean. Goldie's translation of In the Land of the Postscript, the complete short stories of Hava Rosenfarb, is forthcoming from White Go Press, the Yiddish Book Center's imprint, in June 2023. Welcome, Goldie. Thank you, Lisa, and thank hello to everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. So um, I'm, I'm going to start. The roots of Yiddish literature in Canada go back to the beginning of the 20th century, uh, when East European Jews seeking refuge from persecution and poverty, and especially respite from the terrible pogroms in Ukraine in the 1920s, began arriving in large numbers, settling primarily in the cities of Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg. So as I was saying, um, I was talking about the roots of um, Yiddish literature in Canada. And as I said, um, most of the, uh, of the immigrants who came to Canada, especially in the early decades of the 20th century, settled in Montreal, Toronto, and Winnipeg. But Montreal was where most of the immigrants settled. And that provided, that city provided particularly advantageous conditions for the establishment of a literature written in Yiddish. From 1900 to the outbreak of World War II, Jews made up Montreal's largest immigrant community and Yiddish was after French and English, the city's most widely spoken language. The result was a Yiddish speaking culture of remarkable self-sufficiency and vitality, which earned for Montreal a reputation among Jews as the Jerusalem of North America. After the Second World War, Canadian Yiddish literature was given another boost by the arrival of survivors from the conflagration in Europe. Um, these are some of the uh, major writers of Yiddish Montreal. Chava Rosenfarb was one of those survivors. Born in Lodz, Poland in 1923, she survived the deprivations of the Lodz ghetto and the horrors of the death camps of Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. It's not surprising then that when she sat down to write, she wrote about what she knew best, her early life in Poland and her experiences after the war, sorry, during the war. All of her novels are set in Europe and conceived in epic terms. 
dealing as they do with the impact of the Holocaust on the Jews of Poland. But in her shorter fiction, Hava permitted Canada, her adopted home, to play another kind of role, namely the backdrop to the afterlife of the survivors. She does this by affecting a synthesis between her primary, primary theme of the Holocaust and the Canadian milieu in which the stories are set. So that Canada really does become in these stories, the land of the postscript, the country in which the survivors of the Holocaust play out the tragedy's last act. Hava Rosenfarb was my mother. I am the translator of much of her work, as well as the translator and editor of this volume of short stories, which I have called In the Land of the Postscript, the Complete Short Stories of Hava Rosenfarb. The title is mine because Hava never collected all her stories into one volume. Instead, they were published singly, mostly in the prestigious literary uh, Yiddish literary journal, The Golden and Kite, which means the golden chain. As my mother's translator, I am clearly in a privileged position because I was present at the creation, by which I mean I was often present when my mother wrote her stories and I was often her first audience. When she was particularly happy with something she'd written, she would seek me out and ask me to listen as she read aloud her latest creation after which we would discuss it. Most, but not all of these stories were written in Yiddish. With one exception, all of the stories are set in Montreal, where Chava lived for most of her life. Before I say anything about the stories themselves, let me direct your attention to Australia. Chava's second partner, was an Australian travel agent and fellow Holocaust survivor from Lodge named Bono Wiener. Uh, he was a very tall man, as you can see. From the early 1970s until Bono's death in 1996, Hava spent, spent half of every year in Melbourne. This worked out well for her, since it meant that she got to escape the bitter Canadian winters. Because as I'm sure you know, when it is winter in Canada, it is summer in Melbourne. It worked out less well for her children because we missed her when she was away. In any case, during one such Australian summer, when Chava was in Melbourne with Bono, there were wildfires somewhere in the environs around Melbourne. The fires never reached the city itself, but the smoke and haze did. And that was when Chava, surrounded by what she termed the mystical air of Melbourne, came up with the idea for her short story, Last Love, which is the second story in the collection in the land of the postscript. I might add there are wildflower fires now everywhere around where I am living in Alberta uh, with the smoke and haze in the atmosphere. And I can't say that I find it very mystical. But to return to Chava, if you read Last Love, you will very quickly discover that there is absolutely no connection between that story and Australia at least none that is obvious. Last Love is set in Montreal, Paris, and the Canadian Rockies. It tells the story of an elderly Jewish woman named Amalia who found refuge in Montreal after the war. But when Amalia learns that she has only a short time left to live, she begs her husband to take her back to Paris the city where the couple had first met after the war. Once there, she announces that her dying wish is to make love to a handsome young Frenchman. And she rather cruelly charges her husband with finding the, 
excuse me, finding the requisite candidate. It is as if Amalia wants to incorporate within herself a more innocent Europe, cleansed of atrocities and pain. Amalia herself represents the dying order of an old world, corrupted as much by the presence of its victims as by that of their persecutors. So what is the link to Australia? There is none, except perhaps the erotic one that Hava too had escaped her husband to live with her lover for half the year in Australia. So if there is no link to Australia, then why am I telling you this story about the inspiration for last love? Really just to underline how mysterious the origins of creativity, creativity can be and how foolish it sometimes is to extrapolate the life of the writer from her work. Ideas come to writers from everywhere and in all manner of ways. Having said this, I also need to add that many of the stories in, in the land of the postscript do have a more overt autobiographical origin. Take the first story in the collection, which is also the earliest. The, it's called The Greenhorn, and it's based on Chava's own experience of working in a textile factory in Montreal, sewing, button, sewing pockets rather, on aprons. This was her first job after her arrival in Canada in 1950. She was newly married, pregnant, penniless, and in desperate need of employment. She lost the job after only a few days because she could never sew the pockets on straight enough to please her boss. In the story, The Greenhorn, the main character is no longer a woman. He is now a man named Boruch, a Holocaust survivor, originally from Warsaw, working his first day in a Schmatte factory. As you will notice when you read the story, Borg too has trouble sewing pockets on properly and is humiliated by the shop boss for his ineptitude, which in turn causes the one serious confrontation in the story. When it becomes clear that Baruch is reacting to memories from his victimized European past, rather than the far less serious slights of his Montreal present. Hava's dislike of the brutal winters of Montreal also make their way into this story. Although she was always grateful to Canada for giving her refuge, she hated the winters. She always complained about being cold. This complaint makes its way into the greenhorn, where it comes to mean more than just irritation with the climate. Newly arrived in Montreal, the immigrant Boruch refuses to stop wearing his winter coat, even when it is long past the season for it. He cannot seem to get warm in this country, writes the narrator, and he does not find the coat too heavy for spring. But in this case, the omnipresent cold that Boruch feels is not the chill of the Canadian climate, so much as it is the chill of the memories frozen within him. The factory world of the Greenhorn is actually portrayed as a hot place, hot with the steam of factory presses and with the warmth of sexual allure. But Boruch cannot feel the warmth because he is still mourning the past. Interestingly, this factory world is inhabited by Jews. The factory foreman is also a transplanted Jew, as are several of the other workers. The Jewish workers, in fact, are a mix of newly arrived greenhorns, mostly Holocaust survivors like Boruch, and of Jews from earlier immigrations or migrations. But the Jews are not the only workers. There are also French Canadians. 
One of these, a flirtatious young woman, tries to befriend Boruch. The dialogue between the two reveals a chasm that separates them. The young French Canadian is envious of Boruch's European past, which to her suggests the romantic far off places that she can never visit. When Boruch tells her that he has lived in Paris, she immediately imagines the Paris of the tourist brochures, nightclubs, opera, theater, the Paris of elegance and high life. But Boruch has known none of these enchantments. In Paris, he lived the life of a penniless DP. She, for her part, has no idea what a displaced person is. The cataclysmic events that Boruch has lived through have barely penetrated her consciousness. Boruch and the young French Canadian flirt their way through a conversation in which they talk past each other. Her side of the exchange full of unrealized dreams, his side full of painful memories. Winter appears in several of the stories. The bereft mother in the story Little Red Bird sees a child in a red jumpsuit playing in the snow outside her window and is moved to abduct her. Uh, this story incidentally was inspired by an actual news event of a woman who dressed as a nurse in order to abduct a newborn from a nursery in a Montreal hospital. The bickering couple in the story Francois run away to South America in order to escape the winter and their crumbling marriage. The story, The Masterpiece, depicts winter as a kind of celestial avenger for the sin of self-absorption committed by a writer, a male writer, I might add. Which brings me to another aspect of Chava's fiction. While much of it is autobiographical, Chava likes to, disgu to disguise the autobiographical aspects most often by reversing the sexes, as in the greenhorn or the masterpiece, or by attempting to get inside the mind of a country, of a character that she despised in real life. In Edja's Revenge, probably the best known of the stories, Hava attempts to get inside the mind of a capo. This story, too, had an autobiographical beginning and a very dramatic one. When the Lodge Ghetto was liquidated in August 1944, Hava, her mother and sister were deported to Auschwitz. Along with them came Hava's best friend, a young woman named Eugenia Machinkowska, who would go on to become the well-known Swedish novelist, Jenya Larsson. From Auschwitz, they were all sent to a labor camp at Sassel near Hamburg, where they built houses for the bombed out Germans of that city. As you may imagine, after such backbreaking work, the women in the camp were famished. So when the watery soup arrived, there was a mad scramble for the pot at the pot. Trying to maintain order, a capo slapped Genia. Without stopping to think, Hava slapped the capo. The barrack suddenly went quiet. Slapping a capo was an unheard of offense and usually resulted in, be in being sent to the gas chamber. Not only that, but Hava's mother and sister might have been sent to their deaths as well. Hava, her mother and sister, were separated from the rest of the, of the women while the capo decided what to do with them. After a very anxious day-long wait, the capo entered the closed-off space where the three women waited, and she said to Hava, You were right to hit me. I have become an animal. From then on, Hava and those with her were given an extra ration of soup 
for as long as they remained in that camp. I know nothing about this capo aside from the fact that she was Czech. But my mother often repeated what she had said about having turned into an animal. And she always repeated it with a note of wonder. The capo had in effect saved her life. It is this capo who becomes the fictional Rilla in the story Edja's Revenge. Edge's revenge portrays a tangled relationship of gratitude and resentment, which began during the Holocaust and plays itself out against the backdrop of Montreal. The story is narrated in the first person by Rella, a former capo. Capos, um, as you probably know, were concentration camp guards, often Jewish themselves whom the Nazis had put in charge of their fellow inmates. Rella, who had become a capo through bestowing sexual favors on a guard, lorded it over the other women in her barracks, beating them, indulging in the petty cruelties which her position permitted. Her one good deed was to save the life of Edja, another camp inmate, by hiding Edja under a bunk during roll call. After the war, the two women, Rella and Edja, meet again in Montreal, where each has settled unbeknownst to the other. Edja's revenge chronicles their desperate attempts to come to terms with their past and with each other. Rella, the former capo, tries to cope with her past by blotting it out and throwing herself wholeheartedly into the cultural life of Montreal. She becomes a self-confessed culture vulture, desperately running after every new fad and diversion. She also runs after Edja's husband, Lolik, another Holocaust survivor who seeks to bury the past in the distractions of the present. Edja, however, cannot change. In her own mind, she continues living the life of the victim, as if in fear that an acknowledgement that life has moved on from the Holocaust would constitute a betrayal of the past. Edja's revenge is one of the most complex of Chava stories, containing many levels of meaning. Among the most interesting of these, are the varying emotional reactions of the survivors to their new North American reality. For instance, Rella, in her determination to remake herself, masters English and judges her acquaintances by how well they speak the language. She is thrown into despair, however, by the thought that she will never lose her accent. The accent prevented me from becoming a new person, she laments. Despite this, Rella is not above exploiting the advantages of that accent. She opens a lady's dress shop, which she calls La Boutique Européenne, and she admits, my European accent contributed to the continental ambiance of the shop which in turn appealed to the predilections of my customers. This made me realize how attractive Europeanness could be in a non-European setting. This ambivalence about their European roots haunts all the characters in Edge's Revenge, who as a group live dual lives. Outwardly, they adapt very well to their Canadian reality learning English, making a success of their various business enterprises, participating in the cultural life of their city. But inwardly, as the author makes clear, they have never left the Europe that tortured and rejected them. Like Boruch in the Greenhorn, they are still there. The truth, writes Rella, that we was that we felt alien in this new world, that we were so caught up with modernity because we found it so frightening.
Edge's Revenge exploits its Mon Montreal setting for symbolic and contrapuntal resonances. For instance, Hava puts to good use the wooden staircases that are so distinctive a feature of Montreal architecture. These external staircases, which curl up to the second and third floors of the city's older triplexes, are certainly picturesque, but they are also a hazard in both summer and winter, since they are steep and slippery. Edja and her husband live in one such triplex with a winding staircase, and Rella's deep fear that Edja intends to do her harm centers on this staircase, which must be negotiated in order to get to the floor where Edja lives with her husband, who is also Rella's lover. In the end, it is Edja's husband, not Rella, who slips on one such ice-covered staircase, this one outside a brothel, and breaks his neck. This is death by architecture, an ironic and pathetic Canadian demise for a man who had managed to survive the much greater dangers of the European Holocaust. Another feature of Montreal that finds its way into this story concerns the cross atop Mount Royal, the mountain in the center of the city. This cross can always be seen from wherever in the city Edja chooses to live. Even when she marries her second husband and moves to a wealthier part of town, the cross is still visible from her window. This is, in fact, an accurate reflection of the geography of Montreal. Because the cross, you can see it up there, because the cross is the highest point in the city, it can be seen from poorer neighborhoods as well as from richer ones. The fact that the cross follows Edja through her various permutations of personality, fortune, and changes of, of address hints at the symbolic underpinning of the story. As Edja notes, the cross is missing something. Every cross should have its Jesus, and every Jesus should have his cross. The cross is the question, and Jesus is the answer, says Edja. The cross on top of Mount Royal, first planted according to tradition by the founder of Montreal, the Sieur de Maisonneuve, in gratitude to God for saving the city from a flood, attests to the strong Catholic presence in Montreal and to the city's beginnings as a colonial outpost. It thereby alludes obliquely to the place of Jews in Western history, as well as to their victimization, a victimization that culminated in the Holocaust. But while Edge's remark underlines the victimization of the survivors, it is also a statement of incompletion, of a lack of closure. The cross follows Edja everywhere in much the same way as the past haunts the future of all the survivors, bleeding into their presence, present, sorry, bleeding into their present with intimations of incompleteness, of something missing that can never again be found. As with immigrant literature in general, many of the stories in this collection attempt a synthesis of the old world and the new. But this is immigrant literature with a difference because the old world incorporates the stain of the Holocaust, which the new world is incapable of washing away. The stories therefore exist within a symbolic framework which addresses the relationship between Europe and North America. Canada in these stories cannot nullify the European past. Instead, it plays the role of spam in the sandwich. It is bland, neutral territory, 
which is nevertheless dangerous because it's unflavored ahistorical terrain like a tabula rasa permits the intrusion of a corroding European reality. In these stories, Canada is the neutral land of refuge, <clears throat> which like blank paper, patiently permits the survivors to impose their own past on its present. Many of the stories recount bad marriages. The masterpiece describes an apparently harmonious marriage between two survivors that masks the seeds of its own destruction. In a Friday in the life of Sarah Zanaban and Edge's revenge, marriages contracted after the war out of the desperate need to reestablish normal family bonds persist in misery despite the incompatibility of the survivor couples. One form this incompatibility takes is in a divergent attitude towards dealing with the trauma that the Holocaust inflicted on those who survived. One partner in the, in the couple wants to forget what happened, <clears throat> to bury it in the past and pretend that all is well because remembering is too painful. The other partner clings to the past and seems incapable of moving beyond it. The story Francois is an account of one such crumbling marriage. Leia and Leon are survivors who met and married after the war. As their echoing names suggest, their union should have been a harmonious one based on their shared experiences of pain and loss. Both have in fact responded to the emotional emptiness inside them with a similar obsessive restlessness an incessant searching for something they cannot find. Leon has, has silenced the, the howling void inside him by denying it. He has made a fortune in real estate. The land of Canada has been good to Leon in more ways than one. But his wealth has transformed him into a crass vulgarian, a man who exercises his demons by denigrating his wife. His wife, for her part, tries at first to silence her own inner demons by drowning them in activities. She takes courses at universities, volunteers at hospitals, participates in community work and good causes, keep, keep, uh, tries painting, lectures, keeping a diary, moving frantically and aimlessly from one thing to another. Finally, after many years of this, she takes a lover. He is an imaginary lover formed to her own specifications out of her own needs, a French, French Canadian. He is Frenchness squared. And not surprisingly, his name is Francois. Francois tells Leah what she wants to hear, comforts her in her misery, compliments her, caresses her, and converses with her on matters of the human heart. Acting on impulse, but probably with an ulterior motive of trying to save his marriage, Le Leon suddenly decides to take Leah to South America. There, they do touristy things like journeying to the famous Angel Falls, swimming in the Amazon River, and flying out to visit Machu Picchu. But wherever they go, Leon and Leah encounter people who remind them of their European past. A tour guide who may or may not be also be a Holocaust survivor. A German couple who own a lodge on the Amazon River and who may or may not be former Nazis. The presence of Francois in this story 
suggests the complicating element in Chava's depiction of Europe. Europe in these stories is not just the ravaged and desecrated Eastern Europe, ancient homeland of Ashkenazic Jews. Chava's Europe also contains France, the country of elegance, style, civilization, and romance, the country which dreams are made on. This French element provides Chava with a dual image of Europe as both barbarous and ideal. It also permits her to meld Europe to America through the presence of French Canadians in her stories. The geographical juxtapositions also add symbolic weight to the stories for which they serve as backdrop. The survivors in Chava's stories cannot be still. Their afterlife is marked by relentless voyaging. Many in the stories in this collection, sorry, many of the stories in this collection contain a trip beyond the initial transplant of European Holocaust survivors to North America. For instance, Little Red Bird is the story of an abduction of a child to Mexico while Serengeti describes a safari in Africa. These trips constitute a nod in the direction of the legendary wandering Jew. Yet they are wanderings in which the traveler does not get very far, because all the while behind these peregrinations, there hovers the pursuing shadow of an inescapable European past ruthlessly dictating the terms of a North American present. Serengeti, inspired by an actual trip to Africa with a group of psychiatrists that Chava took with my father in the 1960s, is an anomaly among the stories since it features a Jewish prota protagonist who is not a Holocaust survivor and not a Canadian. Dr. Simon Brown, his surname is a shortened form of Brownstein, is a third generation Jewish American psychiatrist who is leading a group of other psychiatrists on a safari in Africa. Among this group of psychiatrists is a Holocaust survivor, Marisha Vishnevska, who was formerly one of Dr. Brown's patients. Dr. Brown has always felt an antipathy towards, towards Marisha, although he could not have said why. The narrator suggests, however, that this antipathy has to do with Simon Brown's projected hatred of his own Jewishness, a Jewishness he has been trying to deny and evade all his life. However, during the course of the group's visit to the Serengeti, Simon's antipathy towards Marisha resolve it, resolves itself into an attraction. But Simon is already married and his wife, Mildred, has accompanied him on this trip. Mildred is not Jewish and this it seems is why Simon loves her. And I quote, he loved Mildred and through her he loved America. The history of America, which he had mechanically absorbed in his childhood and youth, became after his marriage as familiar and near to him as Mildred's heartbeat. At first glance, Chava seems to be preparing us for the classic triangular plot, albeit with a Jewish twist, in which the self-hating Jewish male awakens to the delusional quality underlying his attraction to Gentile women and comes to accept himself for the Jew he really is, an, ex an acceptance that is usually signaled by a romantic passion for the Jewish woman. This incidentally is the plot of George Eliot's uh, Daniel Deronda. But Chava's story is more complex than this. To begin with, the Jewish side of the triangle, Marisha Vishnevska, 
is as full of self-hatred as Simon Brown. Thrown from an Auschwitz-bound train at the age of two by a Jewish mother trying desperately to save her child from certain death, Marisha is found and raised by a Polish peasant woman. Hava consistently confounds expectations, however. Marisha's mother does not die in the gas chamber at Auschwitz, but survives the war and returns to reclaim her daughter, setting up in the girl a tension between the Polish mother who raised her and the Jewish one who took her back. To further complicate the child's feelings, Marisha's mother, having escaped the Nazis, is murdered by anti-Semitic Polish thugs in a post-Holocaust attack on Jews. Marisha is then raised as a Pole by an assimilated Polish Jewish couple. Thus, Marisha's feeling about her own sense of identity are no less complex, no less filled with self-disgust and self-hatred than Simon Brown's. Simon is the offspring of American-born Jewish parents whose highest ideal was to melt into the melting pot. The narrator writes, Simon Brown ascribed everything which he disliked about himself to the disheveled little Jew who dwelled within his well-groomed, sportive body of a modern American. The attraction between Simon Brown and Marisha Brzezniewska is thus based as much on a recognition of their shared ambivalence about their own Jewishness as it is on their shared Jewishness itself. To complicate matters still further, this tug of war over the allegiance and love of a man, the semantic tussle over an appropriate home for the Jew is played out against the backdrop of the Serengeti, a perfect showcase for the demonstration of the survival of the fittest, where nature is red in tooth and claw and life is at its most elemental, eat or be eaten. At the same time, the natural cruelty of life on the Serengeti is constantly compared to the unnatural cruelty of human beings, especially during the Holocaust. When Simon Brown sees a lioness stalking her prey, he remarks to Marisha that the scene reminds him of a photograph he saw of a concentration camp where Dr. Mengele was making a selection. Don't insult the lioness, Professor, is Marisha's only reply. Thus, it is not only Holocaust survivors who cannot escape the long shadow of the, of, of the event, no matter where they travel. It is also third generation American Jews like Simon Brown with a more peripheral connection to the great disaster who cannot evade its impact. I do not have time to talk about all the stories, but I would like to end with a discussion of one of my favorites, which ends the collection. It is called April 19th. April 19th was the date of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943. It is also the usual date around which Yiddish language Holocaust commemorations were, and, and I believe they still are, celebrated in Montreal. The story April 19th is about one such commemoration. I should add that Chava was frequently asked to be a speaker at these commemorations, and she captures the atmosphere there beautifully, I think. I love this story because unusually for a Holocaust story, it ends with a smile, with a celebration of everyday life. April 19th is a ghost story. It is set in the old Jewish neighborhood that in the 1950s, in Montreal used to house the Jewish Public Library 
at the corner of Mount Royal and Esplanade. The Jewish Community Center was housed in the same building. The day before Passover, during an April 19th ghetto commemoration that takes place in this building, the main character, Hirsch, thinks he sees his deceased wife, Rivkele, go up to light a candle on one of the six branches of the six branch menorah, as is the custom at Holocaust remembrances where each branch stands for one million Jews. Rif Gilla and, Her and Hirsch's two children had been murdered by the Nazis. But he has since remarried and established another family in Montreal with Bronya, another Holocaust survivor. The story April 19th has a moving ending that is all the more remarkable for being a happy ending that celebrates the joys of everyday ordinary life as embodied in a, in a football game played at night in Fletcher's field, while never letting us forget the meaning of the Holocaust commemoration taking place just across the street at the Jewish Community Center. I won't tell you what happens in the story. You will have to read it for yourself. But I wanted to end both my talk and the collection of short stories, which is its subject, with this story, because it so perfectly fuses the bitter experiences of Holocaust survivors who arrived in Montreal with lives that were shattered and in need of rebuilding, with the renewal of those same lives in Canada which after all is the theme of all the stories in, in the land of the postscript. Thank you. And uh, Lisa, I'm, I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you, Goldie. Um, that was an amazing walk through the stories, which we really appreciate. I didn't state at the outset that this evening's program is also presented as part of the Yiddish Book Center's 2023 reading groups for public libraries. Um, and it's a selection that libraries, public libraries will be discussing all across the country, which is very exciting to get this work out there and for you to walk us through a lot of what's in these short stories. And they they pack a lot into them. So let me start with uh, this question. You've been translating and working on your mother's writings for a long time. Have you learned anything new or have been surprised by anything about them? in recent years? Um, well, that's a good question. I can't, off the top of my head, I, I really can't think of anything right now. Um, I'm sure after we finish this, I will, I will think of um, a much better answer, but I, I have been translating her work for quite a while. And uh, the the one thing I have yet to learn something about um, is her last novel, which I haven't quite finished translating. And when I was trying, I'm almost done. I have maybe a fifth left to do. And that book has been a revelation to me um, in many ways, but I think I'd rather not say how right now, because I hope eventually to finish it and to be able to um, discuss it a bit more. Um, right now, it's still in an incomplete uh, state. So um, but that is a bit more about it. Um, in sort of in the same vein, um, how much did you discuss with your mother as you were translating, if at all? While she was alive, we would uh, discuss a lot and we would argue a lot. Uh, sometimes we would argue over the translation. Uh, that was especially true when I was translating The Tree of Life. Um, sometimes I didn't like the story and I would say so. And I'm, I'm ashamed to say that the one story I really didn't like was Edge's Revenge. Partly, I suspect, because it's very long story, 
it took her a long time to read it to me. And I think my attention wandered while she was reading it. Um, and I um, and she was reading in Yiddish. It was the it was the period when I was writing my dissertation. And I think I, I just was not in the right frame of mind to appreciate it. Later on, when we when I translated it for um, Frida Foreman's anthology, uh, Found Treasures, I and then my mother sat behind me. And that was really when I started to appreciate the intricacies of the story and to find it. I, I think it's it's a fascinating story in many, many ways. Um, but yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry. Um, the question here is, what is sort of the time frame? How many years was she working on these over a lifetime? I guess they're asking. No, uh, I think what she worked on, <coughs> sorry, over for most of her life were the novels, right? And they're they're long, and uh, that took up most of her energy. But in between novels, um, she would come up with these stories which obviously as stories are shorter, <clears throat> sorry, it took her less time to write them. The story in Australia, she wrote very quickly. She told me, son, I, how, I, I, I told the story about Australia because it has always been a mystery to me what Australia had to do with this story. <laughs> because if you read it, you'll see there's no obvious connection. And um, yet, it was the, I, I remember she returned from Australia once and she told me she written a story in Australia. She sent it off to Abram Sutskever right away. She knew it was good and she was very taken with the atmosphere in Melbourne that, that was the result of those fires. You know, and I, I guess, um, I think I've forgotten the question, but I just, um, amazed me how, where ideas come from. Uh, the story about the little girl the, the, uh, that it, who was abducted as a baby from a nursery, that I remember we were listening to the radio and that, that story was an item on the news. And uh, right away she said, oh, <laughs> and she went up to write it. So, but this was over a period of, um, I think the earliest of the stories start, uh, she wrote in the 1950s, that's the Greenhorn. Uh, the rest were mostly written, I, I think, in the 1970s. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I can't wait to read the collection. Goldie, would you be able to share more about the process collecting and arranging the stories in this collection? And how did you decide which stories to include? How did you decide on the final order? Well, the stories to include was not hard because these are all the stories she wrote. So, uh, and this edition of the stories really uh, takes from several, they've all been published before, but this takes from several sources and I I wanted to include all of them. So that that was not difficult. The order, the first seven stories were originally published as a whole collection um in Canada and have and were then put out of print by the publisher the um so I I I guess when I was thinking of expanding it I knew I wanted to end with April 19th as I said just because I love that story and I think it makes a, a perfect ending uh the I kept the order of the other stories pretty much as it was um, the first seven stories pretty much are the same order as in the earlier collection. And then um, I, it, I, I guess I just put the other um, two stories that are from other sources, um, one after the other in terms of how they were, when they were published before. So um, that that's, uh, basically how how I worked it. I knew I wanted to end the collection on a positive note. 
and that that is why I ended it that way. And the uh, and as I said, the greenhorn is the earliest of the story, of the story. So on the whole, they're not chronologic. I didn't uh, deliberately order them chronologically, but uh, certainly it, it the collection begins with the earliest story and ends actually with one of the latest. Is uh, the Yiddish version of the stories available? It's not available in one place. It's available in, a mo not all the stories were, incidentally, were published in the Golden Egg, right? Uh, most were. And so it's available in back issues of that journal. But my mother never had the idea to collect them together. That was my idea. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yes, they are available, but they're not that easy to find. And certainly not digitized, unfortunately, um, as might have been the case. Um, how did Bono and your mother meet? Well, uh, my mother, my father and Bono all went to the same Bundes school in Lodge um, and my, my parents were in the same grade and Bono was a little bit ahead of them. So, um, and Bono was um, what we call Nietzsche uh, Fabrente Bundist. He was um, a completely committed Bundist, um, much more so than my parents, but they were all raised by Bundist families. So they knew each other from childhood. And, um, and Bono actually appears in the Tree of Life as one of the Bundes leaders of the uh, of the Lodge ghetto. Uh, so after the war, they all um, went their separate ways. Bono ended up in Australia um, and my parents uh, came together after the war. They found each other and ended up in Montreal. When my mother's marriage to my father uh, started to fall apart, uh, she went to New York one time, and Bono, and of course she met up with other friends who were Bundes in New York, and Bono was one of the guests there. And that was when they re reacquainted, they got reacquainted, and that was when um, she started her relationship with him. Um, how did she find her way to Canada? It was difficult. Um, I, she had her. She had a publisher, a Yiddish publisher, in Montreal, whose name was Harry Hirschman, and he. Um, my parents were in um, in Belgium, in Brussels, for five years, desperately trying to find a country that would take them, because they were had no right to stay in Belgium. So they tried various countries in South America, Uruguay, Argentina, the United States was impossible to get into. Uh, finally, because my mother had this publisher in Montreal who was something of, um, a, of a community activist who had brought, who had been very active bringing over Ukrainians from an earlier um, series of, of Jewish pogroms in the 20s. He sponsored um, both my parents. My father also had a distant cousin who lived in Montreal, who managed to get to Montreal earlier. And she, you were only allowed to bring over direct family. So she sponsored him by lying and saying that he was her brother. Um, he wasn't her brother. I, and it's quite, I found that document. I was just amazed to see, but but nobody found out. <laughs> and and they both got into Canada. Um, I'm going to make this the last question, Goldie, if I may. Um, Somebody is asking, uh, when did you go to Alberta and what, if any, Yiddish and Jewish literary life did you find there? And I'm going to take the liberty because I get to um, of adding to that, which is um, also, did your mother have a larger community of writers that she was in touch with um, that in Alberta? 
not in Alberta, I think, you know, just sort of globally, as we like to say these days at the English Book Center. Well, uh, okay, so about Alberta, there is hardly any Yiddish life in Lethbridge. There are hardly any Jews. Um, apparently, this was not true a while ago. And if you know um, Torontonians, probably know Michael Wex. He is from Lethbridge originally. Um, but and and um, I believe Norman Raven, another um, Canadian writer, also has roots in Al in uh, Lethbridge. But almost everybody is gone. My husband and I are among very few Jews uh, in the city. In Calgary, there is a larger Jewish community, and I have friends in Calgary. But um, I think in terms of Jewish life in Alberta, um, as long as we were in Lethbridge, which is where my mother lived until her death, there was really not very much happening. Um, in terms of a larger uh, community of writers, of Yiddish writers, they, yes, they spanned the globe. Uh, they were constantly writing to each other. My mother, I found among her archive letters from uh, Australia, obviously, um, letters from um, Argentina, from, from everywhere in the world because it was Yiddish, right? And also the, um, the Golden Kite went everywhere so that uh, people who wrote for that journal tended to know each other too, if, if only by reputation. And even though the mail before the internet was slow and cumbersome, I think people kept up with each other um, all the time. So there was um, a much larger Yiddish speaking community of writers that she was in touch with. Bonnie, thank you so much for everything you bring to your work, translating and also to helping us to understand what um, all of the Yiddish literary community was like. Um, so thank you, thank you for joining us. Um, we are really excited at White Go Press. Uh, the complete short stories, well, in the land of the postscript, the complete short stories of Hal Rosenfarb, again, coming out in June, 2023. It's an amazing collection of work, beautifully translated as always by you. Um, so thank you. And we hope to see you at the Yiddish Book Center sometime soon. Um, and also a big celebration for Hava Rosenfarb this year, yes? Yes, thank you. Um, can you see me? I, oh, there I can see you. Yes, I lost you. No. <laughs> uh, yes, so uh, I, if people don't know, um, the city of Lodz in Poland has decreed that this year is going to be the year of Hava Rosenfarb because it's 100 years since her birth. Uh, there have been all kinds of events happening already, most of them in Polish. Um, there is going to be a um, an academic conference that will be mostly in English in um, Lodz in October, uh, sponsored by the University of Lodz. And I have just heard from the Canadian embassy. I probably shouldn't say this because it's not it it's not confirmed yet. But <laughs> oh, just between us, Goldie, <laughs> between us, yeah, us and everybody else who's listening, right. um, they're thinking of hosting a reception in Warsaw before the start of, um, of, of the conference. So the, in any case, that's that may or may not happen, but even if it doesn't, I, I, I am very pleased with, with all the attention she's getting in Poland. I wish she got more in Canada, frankly, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> um, the work is just, it's really incredible. So thank you again for bringing it to English language readers like myself. Um, the book is available at shop.yiddishbookcenter.org and bookstores everywhere. It will also be um, for those of you outside North America, we have an international distributor, so you can find it elsewhere on the globe. Um, thank you again, Goldie, and we hope to see you soon. I want to just mention that tonight's program, again, is part of the Yiddish Book Center's 2023 Reading Groups for Public Libraries program. Please join us this Sunday, May 21st, 
at 7 p.m., not on Thursday night this time, Sunday night, 7 p.m., May 21st. A very special program, Shola Mash's On the Road to Zion, a radio drama translated and directed by Carrot O'Brien with original music by Zeke Levine. It's premiering in the English this coming Sunday. Last time Carrot O'Brien produced a Sholem Ash radio drama, the virtual theater was sold out. So get your free virtual ticket and sit back on the couch. It's really an incredible work, um, beautifully translated and beautifully acted by uh, several professional actors. And the music by Zeke is great. To see the full schedule of events or to register um, and to register, please visit yiddishbookcenter.org slash events. I want to take a moment, as always, to thank our members who make all of our ongoing work possible. Please consider becoming a member or renewing your membership at yiddishbookcenter.org slash donate. Until Sunday night, enjoy, stay well, and listen in and we'll see you again soon.